People must be able to make choices based on an informed decision. That was in Kabayomzi Kwanka, a member of South Africa's parliament, discussing Monday's announcement by mega corporation Meta of the banning of the Russia based news agency RT from its Facebook and other platforms. As long as we provide an alternative view to what the U.S. wants to put forward as a narrative globally, then all the principles of democracy, so-called, fly out of the window in favor of try- trying to protect and bullying people around the world and protecting their interests. Kwanka called Meta's decision an example of, quote, who pays the piper calls the tune, close quote, referring to Meta's regular massive receipts of revenue from the U.S. government. That government has apparently been coordinating a series of public and private attacks on RT. Monday's action by Meta followed Friday's announcement by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken that unveiled new sanctions against the news agency. Blinken accused RT of engaging in, quote, covert influence activities, close quote, and of, quote, functioning as a de facto arm of Russian intelligence, close quote. Earlier in the month, Washington imposed sanctions on RT's editor-in-chief, Margarita Simoyan, and three other senior employees over allegations they were attempting to influence the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Dmitry Babich is a veteran journalist based in Moscow. He's currently a foreign editor of the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda in Moscow. We spoke with him via Skype Wednesday. Dmitry The window that we have on the world here in the United States has been shrinking for many years with overt attempts to narrow the sources of media and massive amounts of counter-propaganda to reposition it in the minds of people who look at it. The announcement this past week about RT being tossed from Meta is just one further, rather large step in that direction. What does it look like from where you are in Moscow? Well, let's just look at the facts. Uh, You know, uh, Meta basically removed the Facebook account and other accounts in the social media of this terrible guy, uh, uh, Ryan Root, Ryan Ruth, who actually tried to kill President Trump. Uh, Why do you think it was so easy to do it? While it would be very interesting for the public to have a look on their own and uh, the uh, you know technical side of Meta allows it, just take a look and see uh, what this guy really had to say. Uh, if uh, if indeed Meta was a commercial enterprise, not connected to the government, uh, 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 you know conducting its own independent politics, why not do it? <laughs> Wouldn't it be uh, interesting? Huge ratings too, right? I mean, if you're a private company, you make a fortune selling. Yeah, you it's could like make a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so obviously, there's a lot of uh, influence uh, on Meta from the government and from the, from what I would call the governing ideology in the United States and in Europe. Uh, basically, in the European Union and in the United States, it's the same. Uh, totalitarian ideology, which is uh, in power. I, I think uh, the the main thing you need to understand, if you want to make sense of what's going on in the world now, is that there were not two totalitarianisms, as we were told, uh, Nazism and communism. There are three totalitarianisms, which sprang from three relatively sensible post-Christian ideologies, nationalism, uh, socialism, and liberalism, you know, each of them uh, uh, very good in small amounts. You know, uh, the, the world was transformed by uh, socialist ideas of the end of the 19th century. But of course, if uh, uh, Marx had seen Stalin or Beria, and someone would tell them that this is the communist of the 20th century, you know, uh, Marx would shoot himself in the head. The same story with uh, uh, European nationalism, which degraded into something like German Nazism or similar regimes, which existed in Italy, in in, in many European countries, basically. And liberalism also had its terrible, distorted version. Uh, Not had, it it has its distorted version in power now in the United States and in the European Union. And, and the problem is not 
that there is a government in the United States. The problem is what kind of ideology is is leading this government. And, uh, and the problem with this ideology is that it politicizes everything, uh, just like communism and Nazism also politicized sports, art, the, but they, even they did not reach the same level of politicization that we see now uh, with the ultra liberalism, you know, this third totalitarianism, I would call it ultra liberalism, you know. Even Hitler invited black American athletes to Germany for 1936 Olympic Games. When the United States and the European Union bar disabled people from Russia, you know, the Paralympic Committee, when they barred them from coming to uh, Rio de Janeiro, even, even though Brazilians were ready to invite them, they outdid Hitler in politicization of sports. And that was even before the war in Ukraine. That was because of that story which they injected in the media about Russians being somehow more dishonest than all other athletes, you know, look at the American athletes, you know, look at pumped up muscles that they have. Uh, and they claim that it is Russians using doping and and, right. and uh, having fake muscles, no, not, not Americans. You know. uh, so the, the same story with uh, Meta. Basically, I can tell you that in Russia, the story about the government and the media is much more complicated than the Western media claims. Uh, Gorbachev's perestroika was done by the state-owned media. <laughs> the Soviet yeah. Union was led to its grave by the state-owned media, which was run by very nice but naive people, you know, uh, uh, the liberals of the last years of the Soviet Union. They were nice people, most of them with a real leftist background, some of them children. Of, uh, of truly believing communists uh, who were, you know, some of them were uh, were orphans, orphaned by Stalin, you know, people like Yegor Yakovlev, who was the main symbol of perestroika and who was the editor-in-chief of the Moscow News. But the Moscow News was a government-owned newspaper when, when Yegor Yakovlev headed it. And somehow these people managed to transform the country. Uh, their problem was that they were idealistic about the West. You know, they, they still had a kind of kind of Orthodox Christian thinking. They, they thought uh, when they were young that the Soviet Union was the paradise and the, and the West was hell. And when the revolution in Czechoslovakia happened, you know, that Prague Spring in 1968, and when, uh, uh, you know, the, the Polish uh, solidarity movement started, they rushed into another extreme. They decided that, okay, if, if, if the Soviet Union is not paradise, then the Soviet Union is the hell. And the West is a paradise. And, and of course, it's not true. Of course, the real picture is a lot more complicated. It is more like the Buddhist version of the universe. You know, you create your own paradise around yourself and you can create your own hell around yourself, right? And, and, and there are many hells and paradises in the world. And, uh, and uh, uh, th there is no exact prescription how you can make a, a paradise in every country. You, every country must find its way to paradise. It's, it's a quest. It's never uh, a certain uh, you know, list of criteria that you have to fulfill and then you will be living in paradise, then you will be happy. That doesn't work that way. Yeah, it, it's a lot more complicated. But anyway, uh, so the, the, the idea in the West that somehow state media is bad and private media is good, uh, this is a very primitive vision of media. Perestroika was done by government-owned press. And right now, private press in Russia is very conservative. Uh, I mean, a, a huge part of it is very conservative, very nationalistic. Uh, well, of course, it's a reaction to Ukrainian nationalism and the support of uh, the West for Ukrainian nationalism. Nevertheless, I'm not a great fan of Russian nationalism neither. I think we should not, we should, uh, we should not fall into the trap. Into this trap, we are so dismayed with the insults that we heard from the Ukrainian nationalists and the Polish nationalists that sometimes we have, we have this uh, temptation to respond in the same language, and then we truly become their copies, you know. We, we become like, very much like the Ukrainian nationalists and very much like Polish nationalists because genetically we are the same. 
<laughs> and and oh, uh, when we start when we start doing this tit for tat uh, uh, tit for tat policy, you know, like responding to them in their own way, we degrade ourselves. Uh, in, in in that sense, Putin was very patient for many years, at least I think for 14, 15 years, he did not respond to this avalanche of insults and provocations and, and so much violent actions that we had from Ukraine, from Poland, from the Baltics, from the West. But now he kind of he's kind of tired. He is giving away and, and, and we have lots of so called activists who are ready to 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 become very much the same as uh, the people whom we are trying to uh, to fight, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, th this is a very, very tricky situation. You should not become uh, a, a, a copy of your enemy. Sometimes fighting a very terrible enemy, you become his copy because you need to be equally cruel, you need to be equally uh, uh, deceptive, and uh, and this is a, a road to hell, to my mind. There's no way. But, out. but still, still, you know, despite all the problems, the fact that Putin remains in power, it's a very good guarantee that, you know, this excessive nationalism, this kind of rhetoric can just ebb away if 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 he snaps his fingers. Uh, and in that sense, there is still an opportunity, there is still a huge chance. But the problem is that the West invented this terrible theory, things will not get better until Putin is gone. <laughs> Basically, uh, this formula is based on on a huge uh, on a huge lie. Uh, they say that Putin was the only person to blame for the current confrontation. In reality, they, the Western politicians and the Western media people, they're responsible for 98% of that confrontation. But instead of looking at themselves and trying to improve themselves, they just blame it all on Putin and they say until he is in power, nothing good will happen and we're not going to do anything to improve relations. That, that's a terrible thing because it, it kind of leads us into a dead end. Uh, and, and of course, you know, uh, I'm very much against these simplifications. I'm against saying state media is bad, private media is good, you know, Putin is bad, the West is good. Uh, the world just doesn't work that way. The world is a much more sophisticated place. Yes, it is indeed. And if we can't hear each other speak, we can't really back out of this situation that's being set up for us. Dmitry, thank you for your time, so really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope I was not too dull. <laughs> <laughs> not ever. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. For KPFK, I'm Don DeBar.